Yeah, so hi everyone. I'm Boyk and nice to uh, have you he sitting here and to come to this talk. So basically I will be talking about blockchain and Web3, which are hot buzzwords in the previous year. So you may, might be wondering why would I would de deliver this talk in this Web2 centric conference. And out of surprise, Web2 and 3 has shared a lot of similarities with concepts that we have already have been already familiar with, the front end and the back end part. So today I will mainly focus on the back end part. As for the front end part, you can literally try anything that you have learned during this two days uh, conference and you will know why later. So hi again, I'm Boyk and I am currently working for uh, a security startup in Taiwan as a senior cybersecurity researcher. Our company takes advantage of both artificial intelligence and open source intelligence to help our customers identify, detect, and prevent possible threats in advance. Besides, I'm also one of the member of Change Root, which is a local group in, ta in Taiwan and holding the Hikon every year. So I'm mainly focusing on web security and edge security for now. Blockchain security is what I'm learning and mastering right now. I have experience in giving talks at, um, at many security conferences before such as OWASP Global AppSec DC 2019, HackerOne, HackativityCon 2020, Hikon, and more. So this is the online for this session. Firstly, I will briefly introduce to you uh, what blockchain and Web3 are. Uh, for people who are not familiar with these terms, you will know better about what they are in this section. And then I will go for smart contracts, which is one of the most important functions in the blockchain industry. I'm going to show you what a smart contract is and why it is so crucial to the industry and to the community. Then I will talk about how we do reverse engineering upon them. Starting from instructions, we will do reverse engineering by the dissecting smart contracts step by step and eventually have a clear view of its workflow and logics. At the end, to sum up what we have learned and achieved in this talk, we will demonstrate some cases and we're going to reverse them a bit and see how we can improve our tools eventually to the, in the future. So before we go deeper to topics pertaining to blockchain and Web3, we must understand what they are. So the first blockchain instance is what we have already heard of for years, Bitcoin. The first cryptocurrency, which was invented in 2008 by an unknown person, or a group of people using the name Satoshi Nakamoto. So the term blockchain was invented due to the release of the white paper. It's introduced fundamental cores such as peer-to-peer -peer network and consensus algorithm. And we will focus on these two later. Consequently, DLT is there to cover technologies having high levels of transparency, integrity, and availability in a decentralized environment. Blockchain is one of them, obviously. So we use many social networks in our day, and they are Facebook, Google, Instagram, you name it. They are indeed Web2, focusing on sharing data and content, among others. But where are these data stored? Normally, they are stored in centralized nodes and kept as binary data. Once they are like power outage events or unexpected incidents happened, you will not be able to access this content, this data for the moment, or for good. However, as for Web3, everyone has their data stored in decentralized nodes. Everyone can be part of the network. There will be no one proprietarily having your identity and data that you have no control entirely. There's no single point of failure in Web3. As for the consensus algorithm, it's the most important component for a blockchain that ensures the safety of a network. It is not that easy to explain to you in just one or two sentences, but to put it simply, every participant in this network that helps the blockchain work in the way it is designed should first, firstly have them verified as a net trusted entity by solving the hard problem or staking valuable assets. Because of the do's in terms of sacrifice beforehand, they will tend to, tend to not to be bad guys and earn rewards after packaging transactions into blocks to recover their losses. We have several algorithms nowadays to support blockchains. Proof of work is the most classic one that is used in Bitcoin. And by avoiding miners for mining blocks, 
which is procedure, which is actually a procedure. Participants solving complex puzzles like the give, like the give here with computing powers that requires huge amounts of energy. It is accused of being a great cost to the environment. And that is why we have other alternatives nowadays that doesn't need to waste energy. So how does blockchain actually work? Here is the diagram showing how the blockchain works. And this is from Bitcoin blockchain. As you can see, a block includes a number of unconfirmed transactions in the network. After verifying by a node, namely a particip participant, a new verified block will be chained to the end of the blockchain. And that is why we call it blockchain. So what is so important in this procedure is that there's no need for any third parties to be get involved due to the beauty of cryptography. And once a new block is generated and chained, the information will be broadcasted to nodes nearby. And eventually the whole network will receive the updates information and get synced together. So that means each piece of data is stored in each node. So everyone can read it. The information is there and it cannot be referred back. This is the decent decentralized part that we talk about. Blockchain te technology has evolved over the years into a much more mature technology. The first generation is Bitcoin, which is mainly used as a payment system. However, it is not so practical in reality because it could only process seven transactions per second, while the current payment system running credit cards could do 24,000 transactions per second. It's a huge gap. The second generation is Ethereum, which we will discuss more in the following pages. As for the next generations, it might integrate itself with other promising technologies such as IoT and artificial intelligence, as they are underlying storing or processing there. So let's talk about Ethereum, why it is so famous. Ethereum blockchain is a game changer by introducing a new function called smart contract and rapidly becoming one of the most important blockchains till now. Why? Because by giving developers power to define rules and logics for smart contracts, similar applications can be realized with blockchain. And these rules can automatic, automatic, automatically be enforced and everyone can even verify them since the information is always accessible in blockchain. We then call this apps DS, and smart contracts plays a role as a backend. That are DeFi, a kind of application that serves as a traditional financial product but works on blockchain, has started thriving since 2020 because people now have easy, which means that everyone in this world with the internet could use secure and reliable ways interacting with so-called financial products on blockchain. So in the beginning, I have told you that both Web2 and Web3 has shared a lot of similarities. Here's the diagram showing you that a similar part. In Web3, we access apps through the browser that we do in Web2 in order to talk to the backend. In Web2, backends are programs written in backend languages. Likewise, in Web3, backends are programs in terms of smart contracts written in language that were supported by the blockchain. Additionally, we store data in decentralized node in Web3, and we store data in database in Web2. But where do we execute smart contracts? It is within the Ethereum VM, also known as EVM. So the EVM executes as a stake machine, which means that its primary interaction is moving short-lived temporary values to and from a push-down stack. A smart contract will then be compiled to a binary program composed of a series of EVN OP codes like exclusive for, and, add, sub, and central. Each EVN OP code is one byte, and therefore we can have up to 256 different OP codes. Currently, EVN only supports around 141 instructions. What, what could be the most important philosophy of EVN is fees which is a specific amount of gas that needs to be used to finalize certain instructions. As a result, gas is the minimal requirement to be fulfilled in order to complete a transaction, and each programmable computa computation is intrinsically bounded by it. 
All right. Now we have basically understood some terms and the whole story. What could lead to security issues in Web three? Let's take a look. So the front end part is just like what we have mentioned earlier. That both Web two and three take this as an interface for people to interact with what is behind. We use the front end to give people good UI and user experience to let them access what we want to offer in Web two. And likewise, we also take the same method in Web three. Therefore, the end users will need to understand anything beyond their imaginations, and they just need to go on and go on, and that's it. But here comes the problems. It means that the same threat applied to Web two could also affect Web three. Here are some cases. We have three cases here to show you how attackers could try to exploit the front end. The first one is cross-site scripting issue on Rarible's NFT marketplace. By exploiting cross-site scripting vulnerability, bad guys can do almost anything they want on the page. And the second one is about DNS cache spoofing attack. By exploiting this, attackers can hijack Curve Finance websites and inject malicious code on HTML. And the last one is UI spoofing, which we're often seen in Web two, but this thing can be more complicated in Web three, because the components the the bad guys want to spoof is the function signature. For smart contracts, functions called in the VN are specified by the first four bytes of data sent within a transaction, and these four byte signatures are def are defined as the first four bytes of the kchuck. Of the canonical representation of the function signature, as you can see here, the four byte signature was recovered by MetaMask, a famous crypto wallet, to its original function signatures with their best efforts. By doing this, users will be able to understand what they are going to do with the contract call, and this is how it works typically. And users in Web three are already familiar with this process. However, in this case, the bad guy named a function claim reward, but do other things under the table. People wouldn't notice it in the first place, since the function should do its job by its name. It is for the culture. So you should be able to understand why you could use what you have learned during this conference to do security things on the front end in Web three. They are almost identical. Now here comes the part that I want to emphasize today: the security of the backend. First, let's see some cases as usual. As you can see, that these these are the amounts that a taker try to steal: three million, one billion. But do you know that in the previous year, which is twenty twenty two solely, roughly three point eight billion were stolen. Because of a variety of crypto hacking events, according to the report by Chen Chen Analysis, although this is not so surprising in a such new field that everyone are making MVPs first and the sec security comes after, it is still a thing that we should care in the next few years, especially when there are more people are getting involved. If we if we are developers, we can take advantage of DevSecOps to enhance our security part of the project. I know that in this time slot, there's another session talking about how you can leverage DevSecOps tools and skills to protect your users. In my talk, I will focus on smart contract security as an offense offenses player and instruct you to do some basic auditings along the slide. Of course, the first thing that we need to learn is the basics of reverse engineering. It is not that different comparing to doing reverse engineering against x86 binaries or Android app. You still work on binaries in terms of smart contracts, but it is fortunate that if we work on reversing in Web three, everything is accessible and reachable. Even if we are doing it, even if we are doing reverse engineering in black black box testing, meaning that we don't have the source code of smart contracts. At first, let's talk about white box testing, meaning that we get to see the source code of the smart contracts. By having a copy of the source code, we can leverage tools to help us audit the code. 
We have tools such as Slither by Cho of Bates, MathX by Consensus, and more. So uh, just for fun, can you spot the vulnerability in the code snippets on this diagram? Integer, uh, oh, sorry. Is it an integer overflow on uh, a low list? A low list plus plus? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, anyone? All right. So I just gave you the answer uh, to the question. So basically, you can mint as many items as you want because uh, you, can, you can see that the price doesn't get updated by the quantity. So you can just mint as many as you want, but just by paying one item. Okay, so as for black box testing, we can always try to uh, replay transactions by copying and pasting what we see on the blockchain. Not always works, but worth the try. By inspecting a transaction, we can also get some useful information and understand internal operations sometimes. We can also take another method, reverse engineering, which is a clear and robust way for us to understand the logics behind smart contracts. So no matter what compiled binaries we have, it is a must to firstly disam disassemble machine code into this assembly. On the left is the disassembly produced from the bytecode on the right. For example, the first two by 60 E0, e e0 uh, in hash is to push a one byte value, which is E0 on the stake. Then we turn the disassembly into a structure called CFG, which is a very important structure in reverse engineering space. Once we have it, we are able to understand how a program flows, when to branch out in the central. This structure also takes account for recovering and recovering the disassembly back to a high level view of the program. Now you know why the put control flow graph in my slide title. It is so important for reverse engineering. But why do we re re really need to construct a CFG? What problems get solved actually, you may ask. So there are several reasons. The first is that we want to have correct executing logics. For instance, we have a piece of this disassembly here, and it goes from top to the bottom. And we believe that we move ECX times two to the position due to line one. And do 100% sure that is how it ends? Actually, no, we can't guarantee because there may be a jump from some other parts of the program. To line two, and then and if that happens, we cannot be sure that EX will have the value two in it. As a result, when we once again execute the program, the final decision should be based on the register EBX. And by this example, we can use CFG to help uh, to help us get executing logics correct and produce results that we want eventually. And the other issue is loop. We hate loops when doing reverse engineering because it could make us, make us to doing things in loop and waste time. So the definition of loop is a set of nodes in the control flow graph such that there's a single distinguished entry point called the header. Every node is reachable from the header and the header is reachable from every node and no edges enters the loop except to the header. I won't go into details about how algorithms works, but in general, in order to find loops, we compute the sets of dominators for each block in the control, graph, con control flow graph. Because it's a tree structure, there will be no loops at all. 
There's another important component called SSA form that can be converted from a CFG. With the help of SSA form, we then div the current abstraction to a high level one. Okay, so uh, how do we get our hand dirty in making a CFG? We don't. We don't really need to understand every algorithm and the theorem to do that. Instead, we can leverage the so-called intermediate language based analysis to do us a favor. Intermediate language based analysis provides us a unified way to simplify reversing by feeding intermediate representations. All you need to do is to convert machine code to its intermediate representation operations, and the rest will be automatically handled by the analysis itself. We have binary ninjas BNIL, Gijas B code, and so on. And we just need to pick one of them to use. So in the following pages, binary ninjas IL will be demonstrated to showcase how we take advantage of it to reverse a smart contract. To me, I think BNIL is easier to be instructed to complete the task since it provides Python-based APIs and it, it is well-documented. Good documentation is the king. And this is the sneak peek of what we are having eventually. So we can use Binary Ninjas API to instruct it, to provide the information. The outcomes will be like this. Secondly, we need to tell Binary Ninja when to branch out, and therefore Binary Ninja will construct the CFG for us. Having said that, branches information are sometimes hard to be de deduced. A common way to infer this information is via VSA, Nonless Value Set Analysis. At a high level, VSA attempts to identify a tight over approximation of the program state uh, for like values in me memories, and register at any given point in the program. This can be used to understand the possible targets of in indirect jumps or the possible targets of memory write operations. While these approximations suffer from a lack of accuracy, they are sound. That is, name it over approximate, but never under approximate. By analyzing the approximated access patterns of memory reads and writes, the location of variable and buffers can be identified in the binary. We mentioned that each programmable computation is intrinsically bounded by the gas, and then therefore we can simulate every execution step of smart contracts by giving the contest an upper bound of the available amount of the gas. It is crucial for developers to ensure the efficiency of the amount of the gas to be used in the smart contracts. We can count on the facts and take advantage of that to simulate the contract without worries. Because we can simulate all execution paths, we now have accurate values that a location could take at any given program points of stacks, memories, and building functions. To simulate the execution, we need a comprehensive implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine. I choose Ethereum JS to help me complete the task. The link and the logo are shown here. Basically, I record every important operations output and store the data to several files so that I can pick up any, anything that I want when I need them in time. Here is the sample output of the jump table. On the left, we have a jump instructions on 24 in hex. Therefore, the jump table has an array where its 36 elements has all the information that we need. Remember that we said that we could just exhaustively run every instructions. Here is it. We literally run the instructions linearly and record each branch information along the way. We happen to walk instructions in the DFS manner but it doesn't really give us any beneficial effects, so you can also use BFS. Why not take advantage of this whole thing and get more valuable information? We can also take notes of other interested values, such as inputs of M store, the return value of return data size, 
and the central. So after getting this valuable information, we can send that through binary ninjas API. They are all well documented, so you can just follow the instructions to implement. And this is what we have done eventually. We're now having a functional reversing tool for EVM. Okay, so uh, now let's demo the tool with a smart contract. Here we are given a CTF problem that was released during DEF CON 2018 CTF qualifications, code SAG. The source code for the problems gives us some clues. First is a proxy contract. Through this proxy contract, we will then be able to interact with its private contracts. We mentioned that there's no secrets on blockchain, so we can access the address of the private contracts as well. The user can invoke SAG proxy gamble to play the gambling game in SAG. If the player wins, he or she will be recording in the SAG storage. Then he can ask for the encrypted flag through SAG proxy dot request price function. So it is clear that we need to understand what a SAG con contract is and what the GAN logics are behind the scene. However, the SAG is an open sourced. What should, we, what should we do? So without further ado, let our tool do the rest of it for us. So here's the GIF that's showing, showing you that uh, the smart contract is being reversed by the binary ninjas with our own implementation of the full simulation in EVM. So now we have a clear view of what this contract uh, is trying to do uh, under the table. And we can switch it to a uh, graph view for a better view. And then we, uh, we are given a list of functions that we can inspect. And we click the one that should be the main functions of the gambling game. So you, as you can see that there are so many functions, there are so many basic blocks, it is so complicated. So we can actually change the view from the disassembly to lower level IO, which is the advantage of being IL. So right now we have a better view of the function, better view of each, of each instruction. But uh, it is still complicated, right? So actually we can further change the view to its much higher level of view. So we can go into the higher, high level IL view. And this view, it will give us more, uh, more, more clues about what the country is trying to do. And this time with this view, it is uh, clear to see that uh, the contract, the function is trying to do some operations in while loop. And, and there, are, there are actually two while loops. So after uh, reverse engineering with the tools that we developed, we are able to uh, write, this, write the script to solve the problems. So what can we improve to make it better in the future with this tool? And I have some ideas. So first, to make it produce more uh, smart contract-like code, uh, not the C-like code, because the C-like code is not intuitive in EVM. And secondly, to have a plugin working like I does, uh Flirt plugin. And the FLIRP is abbreviated from the Fast Library Identification and Recognition Technology. So with this plugin, we can identify the library's code. And thirdly, since we have a full simulation EVN environment, we want to achieve the goal of semi-automated analysis, which means that we are able to execute partial code in smart contracts in order to observe something at the moment. Okay, so here comes to an end. And thanks for attending and listening to this talk. And thanks a million. If you have any questions, you can just throw out your questions in Slido or you can send me the mail. 
And final words, this tool is still in progress and it will be released sometimes this year. So if you are interested in this, you can follow my GitHub account.